we'll start uh, with what is AI and um, we have about 30 minutes so this will be like a, a sort of a breakneck compression description I know a lot of people have got some kind of background already but uh, some people don't so I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, introduce a few concepts for um, beginners and more advanced uh, people as well uh, let's see so who am I we'll go to sort of the organization of the talk for the next probably 20 minutes 22 minutes and I encourage you uh, to post questions or comments uh, in the chat and uh, certainly all of you can uh, 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 respond to the comments and questions if I can't respond to them in time if you can all help me I'm going to talk about what is intelligence what is artificial intelligence uh, talk about applications and the um, and the future of artificial intelligence uh, because there's a lot of um, hype and uh, misinformation out there I want to try and sort of get this uh, message across now this is based on um, a, a few courses that I teach in various places uh, so who am I? Uh, no, basically, serial entrepreneur from MIT, uh, Sloan, Sloan 91, uh, basically unemployable uh, after that and had to start companies. Uh, and um, mainly in the machine learning for mobile devices, um, speech recognition, handwriting recognition, uh, mobile app stores, speech recognition. Um, my PhD is from Cambridge, actually Cambridge, England, the other Cambridge, and involved at the MIT circuit network, I'm a, a board member of the club, um, and also I run MIT Angels, which will be the next talk, uh, Deep Science Angel Investing. And I'm part of this project at Stanford, thinking about what is intelligence and uh, uh, what is intelligence in uh, humans and animals, uh, but also machines. Uh, as machines are getting clever and clever, would we ever, ever be able to see a machine that's actually as clever, as self-aware as animate objects? Uh, so I've been involved in lots of projects, speech recognition, uh, mainly was my PhD area, I worked on the sort of first laptops, did a lot of work in Chinese, actually, uh, Chinese handwriting recognition, Chinese speech recognition, uh, did a lot of work on the fir very first sort of smartphones where we have touch displays, which was actually in the 90s. Um, some phones out of Motorola were coming out and uh, Ericsson were coming out with phones. And this is really the sort of impetus for getting cleverer interfaces on devices that you could actually uh, carry with you. And you know, where did I get my inspiration? Maybe all of you can type your favorite science fiction movies, your favorite science fiction movies that actually have artificial intelligence in them. And uh, I get my inspiration from Star Trek. And uh, I presume we've got a wide variety of ages in the audience, it really depends which version of Star Trek uh, you, you relate to. I'm thinking about Captain Kirk with William Shatner uh, in the... Um, a series and probably the next generation, Star Trek, the next generation. And what's interesting in Star Trek is many of the devices, many of the innovations have, have actually happened. Uh, we've got the communicators, we've got the iPads, even the, uh, the tricorder that tells you um, uh, uh, what's wrong with you just by waving it across you. And I think it's a different kind of um, uh, device that people look at now. But one thing we've not got is data, the robot that I was always trying to figure out how it, he could be more human. And uh, the, the advance of the field is we all think, well, that's not possible, can't possibly happen, uh, can't possibly happen. But when I was working in uh, speech recognition in the 1980s, we were working on telephone digit recognition. And this is my project actually at Birmingham University as an undergraduate, Birmingham, England. And we're just doing telephone digit recognition. And my job was to try and figure out how to recognize digits that were aligning with each other. So in those days, you'd have to have a space in between each word. And you could still only do 10, 20 words, even at that. And we said, well, how do we figure out how to let words elide with each other? Uh, So-called continuous speech recognition or connected speech recognition, where you don't know where one word begins and one word ends. And so one of the dynamics here is, you know, the kind of processing power that we have is significantly 
greater today. And this is like one megahertz, not one gigahertz. Um, this is uh, eight kilobytes, not megabytes or gigabytes of memory. And that's one of the things that's created uh, huge um, advances in intelligent devices. Uh, worked on the first laptops. Again, same problem. We could only have, couldn't do the continuous words where the words are lighting together. Now, a few thousand words, but we could only do 60 words. This, again, this was a British company called Apricot, not Apple, but Apricot. Um, and it was really the first one where you could just do speech recognition in a uh, portable computer. Uh, and then uh, after MIT, I uh, was uh, uh, my final project, um, we'll talk about this a bit more, bank check handwriting recognition at Sloan. Uh, and I entered this project, handwriting recognition in what was then the 10K competition. And I didn't even get shortlisted. Uh, so it was um, a bit disappointing, but I had to, I kept going. And again, we did cursive handwriting, same kind of problem to the speech problem where you have, you know, where does one letter begin and when, where does one letter end? Uh, it was kind of a difficult problem. There were a lot of print recognizers where you had a space around every character. So it was a much easier problem. But this was a thing that we uh, sort of, my first company um, that I started out of Sloan, uh, went to Stanford for a little bit and then started this uh, company doing uh, using neural networks to recognize characters. And um, that got bought by Motorola. And that got me on the cover of this magazine, Fortune magazine. And the title here is Computers That Mimic the Brain. And this is like 1993. And we're still talking about it 30 years later. Um, you know, can we still get computers to mimic the brain? Can we actually have intelligence in a machine? Uh, started working in another speech recognition company that got bought by Apple. Uh, and now I run a little institute and a venture capital firm uh, that invest in deep science. Probably the next session we'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, so what is intelligence? Let's go, to, before we get to artificial intelligence, uh, talk, think about what intelligence actually is. And if you ask the, uh, the, the, the wider community, and this question was asked by the Wall Street Journal by academics in all different kinds of disciplines and about half of them replied. And they, they talked about, not pattern recognition, but they think thinking about like um, uh, 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 sort of catching on or making sense of things or figuring out things and uh, you know, cr you know, creative components uh, uh, rather than you know narrow a narrow academic skill or test taking. Um, so so it, be able to sort of solve problems and think abstractly. And that's if we all ask each other, we ask our friends, you know, what, is, you know, what does intelligence mean? Uh, these are the kinds of things we might get. So what is artificial intelligence? Most, well, the most artificial intelligence systems are not that. You know, they're very vertical problems uh, that solve only one thing. Uh, uh, they typically are not doing too much understanding. Uh, and notwithstanding some of the things we have in our phones, like Alexa and Siri, we'll talk about them in a second. But usually they're very, very vertical problems and they can't be transferred to solve other problems. And so there's many definitions of what artificial intelligence is. The word has been around uh, for about, um, about uh, uh, 60, 70 years. And the, the original definitions coined at a conference in Dartmouth uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and um, it means different things to different people. And so the real technical original definition is really human-like performance, human intelligence, perform any task that a human can. Um, this is the number four. And we see these other terminologies in the uh, media, in the field, uh, both in not just the academic press, but the, um, not just the lay press, but the academic press as well. Uh, this term of machine learning and deep learning. Um, but you can think of these definitions. So first of all, is go by good old fashioned artificial intelligence, uh, where we in the old, old days, we used to figure out, well, let's how to encode knowledge as rules into a machine, sometimes known as symbolic systems or symbolic processing. Uh, then we have this term machine learning that came about, uh, which is really looking at numerical recipes uh, that learn from data rather than trying to figure out the rules of why someone has typed 
to diabetes, why don't we just get thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, look at their electronic health records uh, and statistically um, find out what parameters are related to particular illness. And so we have this because artificial intelligence is the technical definition of human-like performance, hardly anything out there accomplishes that. Uh, we have this term of strong AI and weak AI. So most of the things we see out there are weak AI systems. They can only do solve a, a single problem, uh, a, a sort of a vertical problem. And, um, uh, uh, and strong AI is the sort of holy grail, uh, sometimes known as a version of generalized artificial intelligence, where it's more like us. And uh, the thing is, uh, you know, people often get into debates of, okay, well, that's not AI, that's machine learning, or that's not machine learning, that's AI, etc. Uh, these days, um, the uh, vocabulary is such that uh, it's all intermixed. In the literature, people are using these uh, in very intermixed uh, uh, terms. And uh, Wittgenstein, who was at um, Cambridge, was a philosopher, you know, he basically said that language is basically not defined by its definition, but defined how it's used. And so I would like to say and make the argument that use artificial intelligence is can be a stretch of a very, very wide um, uh, description of fields. So there are different types of AI. We talked about the symbolic systems approach, which are rules based. Uh, where you sit an expert down or you have the rules to start off with, like filing taxes and then machine learning systems, which are more statistically based. Uh, I'm going to double click a little bit on what neural networks are, but there are lots of sort of numerical recipes of various kinds, I would say, numerical recipes to actually collect um, parameterizations of data for particular types of problems. And most of the systems we see out there, what's known as supervised learning, where we have data which actually is labeled. So in the handwriting recognition problem, which I spent a lot of time on, um, we have data where uh, we label each data manually. Uh, sometimes once you've labeled some manually, we can then automatically label it from that bootstrap on a, in a bootstrap system. And then we create a model for each character or each collection of characters and may take features beforehand. And then once we have a new character coming in, then we find the nearest model or the nearest, the highest score for the characters. That's what's known as supervised learning. Uh, the other type of learning is unsupervised learning, where we have unlabeled data, the data is not labeled, and we're searching for patterns. So here's a movie database where we have uh, a database of movie stars and the productions they've made and where they made them and when they made them. And then we can do clustering of some kind. And there's a number of clustering techniques uh, out there. And then after the fact, you then give them labels. So we find things that are nearer to each other. We have a, uh, a distance measure. We have to compute and many times we have to figure out what that distance measure is, how to actually define that distance measure. Once you have defined it, uh, create clusters and after the fact, uh, create labels for those clusters. So here we have classic comedians and British comedians um, accordingly, or classic TV shows or American TV shows. So those are the two types. And then we have something in between called reinforcement learning. We'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, you know, really got to use this right tool for the right job. You know, if we do know the rules ahead of time, uh, maybe filing taxes would be the, uh, the appropriate model where we just write the rules down. Uh, but many of the complex problems, we're not actually, we actually don't know what the rules are. Uh, we we uh, have great difficulty figuring out, you know, how do we all understand each other's spoken words despite having different accents um, and different vocabularies and how do we understand each other's handwriting and particularly doctor's handwriting, which is notoriously unreadable. How do people still read them? And that's often where statistics can help. And compared to when I was working uh, in the field at uh, MIT in Cambridge 30 years ago at this point, um, where it's very much centralized in mainly computer science, electrical engineering departments, uh, these days it's uh, many, many different uh, fields are involved. Uh, uh, certainly when I did my postdoc here at Stanford, it wasn't in the computer science department or the engineering department, it was actually in the psychology department. 
you know, they're trying to figure out mathematical models of how the brain worked. And we're seeing lots and lots of fields. Uh, I think one field here is the philosophy department um, is, is not listed here. Certainly linguistics um, has probably had some uh, significantly more uh, presence. But we're seeing pretty much every field, law, looking at ethics, uh, because people now want to know uh, how does this AI work and what is AI? So we talked about weak AI and strong AI, you know, the vertical and the strong AI refers to, really relates to the original definition of artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about neural networks, which I've really pretty much working on for 30 years on and off. Um, probably one of the first uh, companies to come out of MIT 30 years ago, neural networks, uh, out of Sloan actually. Um, and uh, neural networks, uh, been uh, worked on for about 50 years or so, uh, but they're very, very powerful today. Uh, we have a lot more data is one reason. Uh, we have a lot more computing power is another reason. So what are these neural networks? Um, we've got time for this demo. Yeah, let's just show this demo for, uh, for fun. Um, this is a, uh, we'll just show this, this is what spearheaded a lot of the um, thinking uh, in uh, uh, being able to do this. Let's have a look. Uh, right. um, so, okay, yes. Um, right, there we go. Let's just show this demo. Let's start people looking at neural networks again. And this is a game called um, uh, Breakout is an old computing game. Uh, and what it's got is all it's being shown is um, pixels of the game and the score of the game. And all it's been told, it can only move uh, left or right or fire. And it starts out training and uh, uh, doesn't do too bad a job. And remember what I'm saying, all it's got is information of the pixels of the, of, of, of the picture and the score and all it's allowed to do knows it can just move left or right uh, or fire. Firing actually is only at the beginning. And um, you know, after 10 minutes is okay, it kind of plays it, but after two hours, it gets pretty good. Uh, let's see what happens. And this is probably about uh, six, seven years old at this point, but still quite a nice demo. As, after two hours, it's pretty good. It's learning from the data. And where does it get the data from? It gets the data from playing itself playing itself all the time. So you don't have to actually take and label every one. It just plays itself, figures out what the score is. But after four hours, it gets really clever, which most of us maybe have difficulty of doing. Maybe after four hours of playing it, we might. And it figures out a really good way to get a high score. And it keeps playing, pings, pings out here. And then uh, it keeps going. And then it figures out if it digs a tunnel at the back, it can, the score can just go exponential. So uh, it's a, uh, so after that, that sort of got a lot of people, that little demo was done by DeepMind. And after that, uh, DeepMind was bought for $550 million. Oops, hang on, let's see. Roshan, well, there was a question from John asking you about your impressions of Get what really, Deep, yeah. of DeepMind. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, sound right there we go let's get back to my powerpoint there we go and um it uh got a lot of people more interested uh but the roots come really from about 30 years ago uh this is david rummelhart who was at stanford who really popularized the technique of how to correct find the parameters of neural networks and these neural networks have been doing really well there's a game called go which unlike chess Chess, we can compute 14 moves ahead and compute every single combination. Go is a game where you cannot do that. There's so many combinations uh, you can do. And again, the DeepMind team uh, developed a much bigger system to actually beat the grandmaster at Go. And that's a major achievement. Now, Go, uh, that the DeepMind implementation was using 10 to the 16 flops. And what does a human work out? Well, we work out 0 0.01 flops. And you can try and work that out by adding like uh, two uh, eight digit floating point numbers in your head. But because we're MIT, we're probably a bit quicker, but not, not much quicker, so order of magnitude. And um, now we have about 100 billion neurons, uh, 1000 terabytes of, 
of memory. And, um, you know, people think to get human processing, you might need uh, 10 to the 18 flops, uh, which is about a thousand of these tensor processing units. So we're not too far away, uh, but the problem is just getting more processing power may not be sufficient. We may just get the same wrong answer back quicker. And um, the neurons that we're, we have in our brains are very different to the neurons that we've been implementing in computers. Now we have about hundred billion neurons. And the way neurons work, this fundamental cell of the brain, they have inputs that come into every neuron and the inputs are big enough they get sent on, on to a few hundred or a few thousand other neurons, and they then send it out. They're big enough. They send it out to other things. And we have seen all kinds of, all kinds of creatures have different numbers of neurons. You know, it can be as little as a few hundred in small worms. Uh, to large mammals, they can have tens of billions of neurons like us. And to do it computationally is very simple. Uh, we just take our inputs, and what are inputs? They could be stock market values or sound values or pixel values multiply each input by a weight, add them up, and then put them through a function. And this function, there's a number of different functions you could use. And then we just uh, connect them all together uh, into a, uh, a set of layers. And uh, the trick is, is trying to figure out what these weights are. And uh, this, uh, the basic algorithm is known as the back propagation algorithm, which we've got uh, a set of data where we know what the answers are. We can jiggle the weights essentially by working out backwards what the weights should be. And then once we've got them, uh, we can use uh, the system to recognize new uh, patterns. And so you've got to basically for a neural network, you've got to figure out what these patterns are, you know, what's the architecture, what are the weights and what's that function, the activation function at the end. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, sort of applications that I've been working in and open to questions. Um, uh, the new sets of networks, you can actually be a bit more creative. I had a student using what's called generative adversarial networks, which had two sets of networks. One was where you're putting noise in, and the other one is a training set of your um, uh, of parameters which go into this uh, in, into your second one and the second one what it's trying to figure out is what the thing that's produced by the noise one is it a candidate of the training set and of course at the beginning it just presents rubbish it's no good but it, the discriminator test says okay well that's it's not a character go back and try again it keeps wiggling the weights again and keeps getting getting better and better and better and eventually said well actually i can't tell the difference this could be an a it could be part of the training set so we use this kind of system to actually you know some of these things that you've seen in in uh, in, in uh, fake pictures and things to, to actually create be creative and create paintings and so this was trained from a fourteen thousand landscape paintings and um it was a young student of mine and uh, he uh, actually managed to get his paintings on the uh, cover of Business Week. He actually got some pay paid for it. And uh, then this French company, so he just open sourced his code and this French company took the uh, code and created uh, another painting. And that painting was sold for $380,000 at Christie's. And as usual, my poor student, as is normal, the poor artist doesn't actually usually benefit from that. And um, uh, it, it, we, there's this discussion, well, who creates the painting? Is it the code? Is it, is it the, the underlying artists of the 40, uh, 14,000 uh, artists? Or is it uh, uh, the person who implemented it together? So th th we have to start, start seeing these things coming about. So you know, these are more paintings that came about. What work I was doing at MIT with uh, Professor Gupta at uh, Sloan was uh, in 1991 was to uh, figure out how to recognize the handwritten characters on bank checks. And we had the same kind of problem. You know, the letters are touching each other. How do we figure that out? And we figured out that basically by not just using the numbers in the box on the right hand side, but also recognizing the words that you write as well to increase the uh, performance. Uh, stock market prediction, uh, also uh, did some work at MIT on that, worked with Professor Lowe. Uh, that was my master's thesis. And again, we started working again uh, with this little company, Algodamics, doing unsupervised learning, clustering, uh, trying to actually get, uh, figure out when there's buyers uh, sort of tip over uh, into um, uh, behavioral uh, dynamics that where they're all uh, uh, want to buy and that's the time you want to sell. 
uh, and uh, we get pretty good results. You know, how do you sort of avoid market crashes? Uh, and uh, by having so much extra data, we can actually do more, uh, implement more problems. So what's the future of AI? You know, can machines actually have a mind? Uh, is that actually possible? You know, can we actually have consciousness? Um, consciousness is being debated uh, for a hundred years. There's about a hundred definitions of what, what it is. Um, there's been some work in France uh, by Dehaene who says, well, okay, you've got three types of sort of uh, consciousness. Can you actually create a computational model? Uh, Francis Crick said, well, you no, know, basically, he wrote this book in the 1970s and said, well, basically, we're just a bag of chemicals. And um, that, uh, you know, we're no more, our free will is, uh, in fact, no more than the behavior of our cells is working with each other, uh, uh, working with each other, rather than something that's actually um, a, a, a fundamental precept. So I'm going to stop there uh, right now. I think there is a site you can go to and uh, you can actually uh, decide whether you can actually get a machine that's uh, self-aware in the uh, um, uh, in, 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 accordingly. So uh, let's see, anybody got any comments or questions? Ron Jean? Ron Jean. Right. It's a... Uh, yeah, so there's a few comments and questions about the, uh, let's see, got, uh, let's see, where, what are the impressions of deep mind? What's, uh, do you feel pretty needs about the progress of the field over the, okay, uh, let's talk about this. How much progress has been made over the field over the last few decades? I mean, there is a, an argument that in science, once something works, uh, just as in industry, everyone starts working on it. And, um, there is an argument that the fundamental techniques that we're using today, these deep learning networks, which are many, many layers, are uh, uh, that really, you know, the, the principles were set in motion like 30, 40 years ago, and we've now just, we've just got more computing power, more data, and there are a few tweaks that, would, let's not discount that, there are some, uh, some, pro some, some progress, but is this the right way? Uh, I typically don't need to look at a million faces uh, to learn something. I can just look at something, something once or twice. And uh, there is an argument that uh, maybe there's too much work uh, going here. Uh, there is a, you know, there's, there's certainly people at MIT looking, going back to Bayesian statistics, uh, saying, well, maybe we can, there's other things uh, that, that we can actually um, look at because uh, you know, maybe we need a, um, a biological substrate because the only existence proof of human-like intelligence is us and we don't use silicon and we don't do any of these other other things uh which jobs will be uh replaced by ai uh it's kind of interesting that we are seeing things that are very i guess what i call vertical uh that are mechanical that are process oriented that are at the greatest risk um uh, I think actually nobody is safe uh, because uh, you know, it used to be that uh, you know, it, you know, it used to be people, the more intelligent people, the more intelligent jobs, so to speak, would think their jobs are safe. Uh, but that's not the case. You know, we're seeing radiology exams being done better by machines than by doctors. Um, uh, certainly, I think the ones that are need more empathy, emotion, uh, uh, maybe physical dexterity uh, might be more, uh, might be safer. It's quite a common question, you know, which, uh, uh, you know, which, uh, which job is safer, the doctor or the nurse? Probably the nurse, actually. Uh, the person who needs continual, continuing uh, um, empathy with the, um, with the patient. Uh, so let's see, we've got two more minutes on this section. Um, Let's see, if anyone wants to ask a question verbally, pipe up, otherwise I'll pick one out from the chat. Um, let's see, it's, um, what are your impressions of DeepMind? So DeepMind, for those of you who don't know, is a subsidiary of uh, uh, Google, and um, they are, um, uh, a, um, have lots of bright people, and they uh, pay lots and lots of high salaries, 
and uh, they and it's kind of like the, probably the Bell Labs of today uh, is is what what they have. So, but I, I think the last time I looked, they're a huge financial drain on Google, and just as Bell Labs um, had uh, difficulties in the uh, last couple of decades, um, we have to see when the going gets tough financially. Uh, eventually, the groups have to sort of finance themselves.